We've installed SQL Server, but what next? Learn about important configuration options. Coming at you right now. Welcome to this video on SQL Server. My name is Kevin Fiesel. I am the proprietor of Catalaxy Services LLC, a consulting firm which specializes in work all across the data platform space, especially SQL Server. If you followed along with at least one video in this series, you will got a fresh new installation of SQL Server hanging around. That's great and all, but there's a lot you can do to configure that server and make it more robust and perform better. We've got a lot to cover in the demo section, so let's get right to it. SQL Server configuration could easily stretch to a multi-hour video. This is clearly not that. What this is though, is me going through a SQL Server instance that I've just set up and talking a little bit about some of the configuration settings that I look at and maybe offer a little bit of advice along the way. To get started, I'm going to use a different tool than what we saw in some of the prior demos. This is SQL Server Management Studio. If you have not downloaded SQL Server Management Studio before, do a quick Google search, search for download SQL Server Management Studio, and you'll get the latest version, which as of the time of recording, 19.0.1. I can download this. It is approximately a 630 megabyte download. So you will be waiting for a little bit of time, but that wait is well worth it. Within Management Studio, I can connect to a SQL Server instance pretty easily using the connect here, and I'll select Database Engine to connect to a SQL Server instance. This is my instance. Now we have a tree menu that shows off what capabilities are available. This isn't a Management Studio tutorial, so let's dive into the administration. If I right click on the instance and select Properties, this will allow me to see quite a few interesting configuration settings just up front. Like for example, I can see memory and processors that I have just over four gigs of RAM. Now in real life, I have more than four gigs of RAM available. This is a virtual machine where as it asks for more memory, it will receive more memory. So don't be too afraid of that. Uh, also means that if you're running this in uh, Hyper-V or VMware, you might see memory settings that are not quite what you would expect. Actually, if you see this number is low in a real server as opposed to just a VM that I'm using for a demo, that's a good sign that maybe your systems administrator should be fixing a specific amount of RAM, which in real life they generally do. Speaking of RAM, let's select the memory tab and we can see minimum and maximum server amounts. I typically keep the minimum server amount at zero. Maximum server memory allows you to have some overhead where SQL Server won't greedily grab up all the memory. It is happy to grab as much memory as it can and it will hold on to it until Windows requests some memory back. This is a good thing because what this means is that more of your data is in memory. It doesn't have to read from disk. Memory reads are a lot faster than disk reads. So we want to have as much memory as possible going to SQL Server while retaining enough overhead available to satisfy any operating system requirements. I typically don't look at the index creation memory or minimum memory per query. They exist, but I just haven't typically had a need to work with them. As far as processors go, I want to see this left alone for the most part. Processor affinity masking is something that you can do in extreme circumstances. And generally, if you have to do it, you know that you have to do it and you're qualified to do it because you've done it. It's a little paradoxical that way, but if you don't know what you're doing here, the best bet is don't mess with it. Down below that, we do have maximum worker threads. And I have seen occasions, especially when you have a whole lot of databases with database mirroring or availability groups, where that number of worker threads has to go up. Normally, I'll keep it at zero, let SQL Server handle the number of worker threads, but you may run into cases where you have worker thread starvation, where you need more worker threads than SQL Server thinks you need, and might have to bump that number up. In the security tab, I like to have SQL Server authentication on. We talked about this in a prior video. This is a good way of giving me one other way to connect to a SQL Server instance in case everything goes bad. For login auditing, by default, it will only log failed logins. 
I actually prefer to have the both failed and successful logins enabled because this will help you catch a scenario like fail, 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 fail succeed. And we wanna know, did this person who might be a malicious actor actually get in or did they just give up? When we get into options, there is common criteria compliance, which you might need to enable. C2 audit tracing has been completely obviated by common criteria compliance. C2 audit tracing is now obsolete. I would not recommend checking that box. If you are in a regulated industry and need to use common criteria, it is available for you. I would not check it just for the sake of checking it though. Cross database ownership chaining, don't check that thing. I'm gonna put a link in for module signing. Module signing is the way to go when you need security rights across databases. Just ignore cross database ownership chaining. The next step is connections. I usually don't touch anything on this screen here. Database settings, default index fill factor is available to us, so I wouldn't touch it here. I would instead have individual indexes with their appropriate fill factors. Now I will definitely compress backups and set backup checksums. You're going to want those in almost every case. And also database default locations. If I see program files like I do here, typically I'm gonna say, this is probably not the best place to put these databases. Usually we're going to want data log and backup on different drives at least. Even if you're in the same SAN, it still makes sense to have ones that are going to be different because then if you run out of disk space on your backup server, it doesn't cause SQL Server to fail. The advanced tab also has some nice things. File stream typically is off and most of the settings as we move through here, I don't usually touch. Now blocked processes threshold, if you want to send a message every few seconds, if there's say five seconds of blocking, you can set that number above zero. Boost SQL Server priority sounds like a really good idea. It's a really bad idea. What this does is in situations of extreme load, it means that SQL Server is going to get a higher share of attention from the processor, from memory. Uh, Windows is going to bias toward it, which sounds like a good idea, except that when you're in an extreme scenario like this, doing so may actually make the machine unstable. Now, optimize for ad hoc workloads is an interesting quandary because for a long time, the answer was, yeah, just go ahead and set it to true because it can help in some circumstances and it usually doesn't hurt. So what's the big deal? Not too long ago, Randolph West and Eric Darling have come out with blog posts that explain what the big deal is. And the real big deal is that especially when you're working with tools like Query Store, by optimizing for ad hoc workloads, you're not getting execution plans, one-time run execution plans in Query Store. So you may have a problem that optimized for ad hoc workloads is hiding because you don't have the metrics associated with those one-time queries. Which means nowadays, I would generally recommend you leave it off instead of on. Scrolling down a little bit further, we have cost threshold for parallelism. A quick rule of thumb for me, add one zero to the end. My experience here is that a number that is somewhere between say 25 and 100 is going to give you better performance in the long run for transactional systems than the default of five. What this basically is doing is saying that SQL Server estimates out how difficult a query will be to get data for. And based on that total cost, we'll say, is it even worth trying to make a parallel plan? And if you exceed this threshold, it will at least look to see, could I do parallel processing for this particular query? Parallel processing has its advantages. You can finish potentially faster. However, it also has its costs. Parallel queries can perform in odd ways, especially if you have data that is skewed. We'll talk about that in some other day, I'm sure. Max degree of parallelism is another thing that we could potentially mess with. On a transactional system, I'm usually gonna select somewhere between about two and six. On an analytical system, on a warehouse, it'll be at least one half of the cores available to the SQL Server instance. Finally, permissions. I don't spend a lot of time in SSMS on permissions here. You can scroll through it and see what these permissions are that are available, but typically I leave this alone and I'm gonna grant permissions using T-SQL. That way I can save those scripts elsewhere if I need to rerun it later.
So we've looked through our configuration. I've made a couple of small tweaks, but that's not all. We can also use SP configure. SP configure is a built-in stored procedure for SQL Server. Now we can see that I've got about 29 separate things that I can configure. We have current values, which are the run underscore value. We have what they're configured to be. We have a minimum and a maximum. And I can also specify show advanced options, which is currently a zero and set that to one. By executing this command, I'm changing the value, which means I need to reconfigure. Once I reconfigure, what this essentially is saying is, okay, SQL Server, reread those configuration settings, which on Windows are in the registry, on Linux are in a file. Because I am showing advanced options, we now went from 29 to uh, quite a few more, 95 separate config settings. I can then change any of these settings and make a modification. Like for example, let's say I want to turn on XP command shell. I can change that to one and then I'll go. And of course I need to reconfigure so that SQL Server knows that you need to reread those configuration settings. If I highlight and run just this command to execute SP configure with the configuration setting of XP command shell, instead of seeing all 95, I just see the one that I care about. Last thing I wanna look at is individual databases. I don't have any special databases, so let's start with model because all new databases are built off of model. In files, I like to make sure that growth is set to a megabyte value. So here it's auto growing by 64 megabytes, which is good. For my machine, that's fine. I can also set it to percent, but don't set it to percent. Growth by percentage is a trap. If you have a one terabyte database and you're growing 10% auto growth, you're growing 100 gigabytes at one time. Any sort of command to grow 100 gigs in SQL Server will take some time. And what happens is your web application that's trying to just write one row, insert one row into a table, may cause that auto growth to hit. And now it's trying to grow 100 gigs. It times out, your SQL Server call fails. And then the next person who tries to insert a row is then going to try to hit that auto grow again. It was gonna to try to grow 100 gigs, it's gonna fail. That's why auto growth in percent is such a bad idea. Do that for files as well as logs. I can add additional files if I want different file groups, if I want to write to multiple drives. Speaking of file groups, there is an entire tab where I can add new file groups. I can add memory optimized file groups as well. Although be warned that once you add one of those, you can't actually remove it. For options, recovery model and compatibility level are both really important. I'll talk about them someday in the future. Containment type, don't really care about. This was something that Microsoft didn't push far enough in SQL Server 2012, so. When it comes to the automatic side, keep auto close off, keep auto shrink off. I do recommend auto update statistics, and especially if you're talking about busier, more active servers with larger tables, I like to automatically update them asynchronously. So if you have a stats update, just let the current job finish and in the background update those stats. That way you don't end up in a cycle like I talked about where you start executing, it fails, it rolls back, the next execution tries, fails, rolls back, and you just get stuck. So that I do like to keep on for busier servers. Scrolling down, there are other options available to us as well, like database scoped configurations. This is how you're going to be able to control server level settings at a database level. There are some cool ones in here. Each version of SQL Server gets a few more. When we get into miscellaneous, most of these things I tend to leave alone, but read committed snapshot isolation should be on. This is an area where in almost 100% of cases, I think it's true. The default for read committed snapshot isolation should be true. There are rare exceptions where read committed snapshot isolation is bad and you need to use the classic pessimistic concurrency. For the other 999 out of 1000 scenarios, RCSI will give you performance improvements, will remove blocking, and will remove dumb ideas like putting no lock on all queries. For page verification, make sure checksum is on. That's been the default for a while. That is the best solution. And by making these changes on model, what this means is every new database is going to get that same set of configuration values. 
automatically. Over the course of this video, we looked at several places where you can change configuration settings on a SQL Server instance, both at the instance level and at the database level. SQL Server Management Studio gives you a nice graphical interface to make these changes, and we also learned that the real power is in SP Configure, as well as in database scope configuration settings. Finally, we covered a few of the types of configuration options I tend to look at for databases, especially the model database, when I'm reviewing a SQL Server instance. For the sake of time, we did skip a few of the most important settings, but there's a reason for that. We'll get back to them in future videos where we can go a lot more in depth on each topic. In the meantime, we'll have links and show notes in the description below. And until we see each other in the next video, take care.